Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 21st. First up, I was just scanning through some different articles and I caught this one from PC World. Destroying your hard drive is the only way to stop the super advanced malware. Um, I'll just read a little bit of the article here. A cyberspace, a cyber espionage group with a tool set similar to ones used by the U.S. intelligence agencies has infiltrated key institutions in countries including Iran and Russia utilizing a startlingly, a startlingly advanced form of malware that is impossible to remove once it's infected your PC. Actually more infected the firmware of your hard drive is what they're saying and this is from Kaspersky Lab and they say it looks very suspiciously like although they can't trace it back to tools that the NSA, that's the National Security Agency of the United States, uses for spy work and stuff like that. Not that I think probably the average person needs to panic about this, but just knowing something and tools like this are out like this, I have a little bit of suspicion that people that want to use it against just your ordinary computer users may get a hold of either this or be able to back engineer it and do something like this. But evidently, even uh, in some cases, even reflashing the firmware on your hard drive will not get this off your system. And basically, once your hard drive is infected with it, it's just done. You just, you the only, like they said, the only option really is destroying it. So gives me kind of a little bit of an indication that maybe some of the hard drive manufacturers, probably being U.S. companies, at least U.S. based companies, probably were at work with the government about this and there was some kind of backdoor built into them or something. I, I have no proof of that whatsoever, but this I just get a sense of this after hearing so many stories from like uh, technicians that work for AT&T and places like that claiming that they've installed certain black boxes and stuff like that for monitoring at some of the main switching centers. It just... Uh, it doesn't pass the smell test is what I will say about that so just be forewarned probably not something right in the immediate future you have to be concerned about but something maybe uh, maybe possibly somebody could come up with something to uh, counter this maybe some type of open source or something which I will be talking about in a minute but yeah it would be kinda nice if you could have some kinda when you buy a hard drive you could flash it yourself with open source firmware that uh, you could get more control of or somebody couldn't get control of possibly and this is another one about open source. This is uh, anger over BBC radio streaming changes. Evidently, like a lot of places that stream audio or stream anything for that matter, you have to pay certain license fees depending on the type of software and codecs you use. And evidently, because BBC license renewals are coming up and they don't want to pay a lot of the licensing fees, they want to switch to a op more open format instead of using, uh, let's see, what do you have? have to use. Well, let me just read a little bit of the article on this too. <clears throat> Listeners have expressed anger about the BBC's radio streaming service as the broadcaster continues to change its audio streaming formats. It has left some internet radio devices, including some models aimed at blind and partially sighted listeners, unable to receive BBC radio at all. Uh, let me see if it says back down here. I think it does say the uh, yeah, was the, they use the Windows Media Audio format. So obviously you're going to have to pay licensing fees to Microsoft for uh, any devices that have firmware, um, any software you use or anything like that. So what they want to do is they want to switch to a, an open source type of audio streaming. I believe it's in uh, MPEG type of format that's open source. So for people that have older equipment it is going to be kind of a pain if you have real old equipment you're probably going to have to mine new equipment and there were some people that complained about that. If you have newer equipment they're saying in a lot of those cases it's just uh, mainly you're just going to have to do a firmware upgrade and then you'll be able to listen to the BBC radio on, on streaming uh, once again. And there's also the problem too with some of the licensing uh, uh, people are complaining about some of the sports shows being streamed too, but that's more a licensing of the distribution areas. So, in other words, if they have license to stream a, a soccer game or as they, they call it football in the BBC area or in the, uh, maybe in the area of the UK, they may not have licensing to stream it if you live outside of the area of the UK. So, that's just a matter of licensing that, yeah, people tune into the sports um, station wanting to hear the sports stream and they don't live within the country and so they just hear either an alternative audio stream or nothing. Um, that's just licensing fees. There's not much they can end up doing about that. And this one actually was sent in by a lot of different people. I won't even 
start listing the names. This was sent to me by, by just a, a huge amount of people. A close call of 0.8 light years, evidently 70,000 years ago, this uh, binary star, it's a star in a brown dwarf companion, actually skimmed into our solar system. Now, if you follow some of my TDD reports in the past, you know that the solar system doesn't just consist of the sun and the planets circling around it. It also consists of going out to Pluto and beyond the Kyber Belt objects and then going beyond that into the Oort cloud, which is where a lot of our comets come from. There's this uh, surrounding, this kind of halo cloud of surrounding objects that once in a while because of, oh, stars passing close by or even I think just sometimes orbital pertub perturbations from uh, our own planets can actually knock a comet to where it either goes outside the solar system and is lost forever or comes in for regular trips around the solar system. But uh, what they noticed when measuring the star system, and what is it called? They have a nickname for it here, too. Let me get the nickname. It's kind of cool. Uh, what is it called? Come on, I saw it here somewhere. I think it's called Schultz or something like that is the nickname that the star is given. Oh, well, lost it in here. But anyway, what they do is, as a star um, is moving, they can actually measure the tangential motion of the star. And what that means is you look at an object that you know is, is traveling in some direction, and you see what kind of an angle it produces. And if it's not producing much of an angle at all, and you know the thing is moving, then there's two possibilities. Either the thing's coming towards you or the thing's going away from you, because if it keeps staying in the same point in the sky and doesn't even move slightly, that means it, you know, it's either one or two directions. It's either straight towards you or straight away. And they calculated by the speed of this thing that somewhere around 70,000 years ago, this thing actually grazed our solar system. So if we'd had the technology back then, but yeah, um, back when people still were uh, around and civilizations were around, at least the beginnings of them, uh, this thing would have been a very bright star in the sky. So that's kind of interesting. Ah, uh, here it is. It's called Schultz's star. S-C-H-O-L-Z. Schultz's star is what it's called. Um, so anyway, check that out. That's an interesting article to read. And last up, this was sent to me by Navy Thomas. This isn't so much as an article as just a video, so I'll play a little bit of it here. I did an article, I think about a year and a half ago, about DARPA wanting to have different robots be able to do different phases of firefighting, such as hooking up a hose, such as turning valves, stuff like that. Well, the U.S. Navy has a prototype fighting, firefighting robot right now that they're testing out that can uh, do most of these things. But uh, it is a first-generation robot, definitely, if you see in the video here. It does not move very fast. It's not very agile. So if you had to have a fire put out very fast, it's not going to be anywhere near as good as a human being. But uh, if they can get it improved just a little bit, the nice thing about it is they can go into the fires and a lot <clears throat> and, get, and stay in a lot more dangerous areas and a lot more high heat areas than human beings can. Uh, plus, they're not going to give up and get tired. So they can just keep fighting and keep fighting until the fire is put out. But that's kind of nice if you get a chance to uh, check that out. That's done with uh, the U.S. Naval Research Center um, and also uh, a couple of universities are also helping them with the development of this project too. They also have a little thing on a, a flying robot too, a, a pretty pretty good size, maybe a medium-sized flying type of uh, copter robot too to get into a very narrow and difficult spaces to get into in uh, naval ships. So if you get a chance, check that out. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week. Oh, one last thing I almost forgot. I told people last week on the TDD report that you did not have to have a Facebook account to be able to see the Dumpster Divers webpage. I was wrong about that. Evidently, Facebook will not allow you to see any of the content on Facebook unless you actually have a Facebook account. So um, sorry, that is one reason why... Um, and thank you, Jeff, for letting me know this, that uh, people without a Facebook account are not going to be able to see the Dumpster Divers group page um, until I can figure out some workaround for that or somebody else comes up with an idea. Um, all I can say is just I regret that you're not going to be able to do that.